I say as the vice chair, I'll chair the meeting. Do we have any further apologies today, Mark? Yeah, uh, there's a couple of apologies, uh, Chair. We've got apologies uh, from councillors um, Douglas and Councillor Fisher, and of course the apology from Marie Quigley and Stephen Trainer. Thanks very much, Matt. Is there any other further apologies? Uh, Chair, um, Councillor Baird just trying to get in. He's just getting another link just now, so he, he will be with us just very shortly, but I would just for us to carry on and he'll catch up. Yep. Thanks, Councillor Barclay. Agenda number one is declarations interest in terms of ethical standards. Does anybody have anything to declare? Nope. Agenda number two is the safety and wellbeing strategy 2122 in the revised safety and wellbeing policy on pages 5 and 30 of your papers. And Fiona, you're going to take us through the report. Just to be clear, it's going to be Fiona Duddy that will take us through this oh, report. Sorry, Fiona Whitaker. Fiona, Fiona Duddy, Duddy, yes. <laughs> it's Fiona Duddy. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks. Just Thanks. To the report. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This report covers the proposed safety strategy for the Council 21-22 and an updated policy document to reflect insourcing of CLNL into the Council. The, so covering the strategy first, uh, section one of the report details that the strategy has been written in line with the council ambition of building a workforce for the future. If we want to deliver on our ambition, then we need a workforce who are healthy and safe whilst going about their daily role and demonstrate our commitment to this to our employees. So this needs to be led from the top and the strategy is five priority work streams with a supporting action plan to illustrate how we can achieve this. Section two lists these five work streams, which are leadership, occupational safety and wellbeing, safety culture, risk management and performance measurement. None of these work streams should come as a surprise. And whilst they will no doubt present some challenges to be overcome, the safety and wellbeing team are ready to advise, support and guide in order to progress them. Appendix one is the strategy document and gives some background into where we are at just now, where we aim to be. Um, and section three lists the overall aims of the strategy. Again, nothing that you wouldn't expect to see. Uh, legal compliance is an absolute minimum, improving our incident numbers, reducing our risks, avoiding enforcement attention, sound partnership working with our trade unions, and strong leadership in health and safety. Section four gives you an insight into some of the work carried out by the Council Safety and Wellbeing team and highlights the level of competence that exists across a team of professionals who have always maintained a solutions focused approach. And everything they do. I think the last year has more than demonstrated our talent and ability and the strategy is the next step in moving the council forward in terms of safety and well-being. Section 5 details information on each of the work streams and what they mean for us as an organisation. Section 6 covers the proposed action plan for each of these work streams and the plan timeframes. There's activity in the action plans all senior managers are required to commit to including interaction with employees, mandatory training, and supporting the progression of some of the other plans, including the mental health strategy. I'll just cover off the second part of the report, which is the updated safety and wellbeing policy. A slight amendment was made to reflect that CLNL have now been insourced to the council and to ensure our policy remains up to date. The policy is a legal requirement, so it's important that it reflects an accurate picture of the organisation and is made up of three areas. The statement of intent, which is signed by the chief executive, illustrating the commitment to ensuring health and safety in the workplace, positions and roles of the people in our organisation who have specific responsibilities for health and safety, and finally, practical arrangements as to how we will achieve this, for example, training our workforce, carrying out risk assessment, etc. There will be further rev uh, revisions made to the policy to include an updated structure chart and any other relevant changes as we move forward. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on either document. Thanks, Fiona. Does anyone have any comments or questions to Fiona? Oh, so we can agree to the recommendations on page five. Sorry, I raised Thank my you. hand there. Oh, Councillor, Councillor apologies, Peter. Apologies. Councillor yeah, Councillor I, I was Peter following Kelly the chat bar instead of the, the hand raising. Okay. On you go, Councillor Kelly. Thanks. Um, just a quick question on the page eighteen. It shows that we're looking for a reduction in the number of reportable incidents. Do we have a base figure as to what we're looking, what the figure was for last year, for example? Our numbers, reduced are, by 
our numbers have fluctuated slightly um, because of COVID, because um, all our incident numbers obviously have changed with the, the way we've changed and how we work. Um, so we will we will look back over the past few years, to be honest, to get a better gauge and take an average from that and base it on that. Um, I can get you, I can send you on numbers if you want, but we haven't included it in the actual document. Um, but we will be doing an annual report as well, which will I'll give again that kind of detail of over the past couple of years. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. So we agree to the recommendations on page five. Agenda item number three is the end of year absence statistics. And uh, Tracy Simpson, I believe, is taking us through this. Yep, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in summarising the report, you'll firstly note from the executive summary that this is the first time since 2016-17 that the Council has met its absence target. Um, and whilst COVID-19 will clearly have had an impact on this success due to the lockdown periods and people working from home, it's hoped that the increased effort by both managers and HR in addressing absence will also have had an impact on these figures. As advised within the executive summary, long-term mental health issues remain prevalent within our absence figures um, and significant work is underway to analyse the reasons for this and to consider further solutions that may help reduce these absences going forward. Section 1.1 of the report confirms that our outturn figure for this year was 7.78 FTE average days lost per employee against a target of 9.98 FTE days lost. And last year, the outturn figure was 10.55 FTE, so clearly a significant improvement in performance. Section 1.2 also confirms that even if we took into account the COVID Nineteen absences in our year end figures, the outturn for the council, um, we would have still have met our target. And section one point three of the report discusses the ongoing work that's been undertaken to assist in the implementation of the new sporting attendance policy, and it outlines the support and training that is available to managers to ensure the smooth and effective transition from the current policy to the new one. Um, and I can inform that that training is is well underway. Um, and we're getting um, good attendance. Just to point out that the new sport attendance policy is very much focused on supporting employees to attend work and address mental health and wellbeing issues more proactively and at an earliest point um, where possible. Moving to section two of the report, I would draw your attention to 2.2.3, which confirms the absence target of 6.70 FTE days lost for teaching staff was also achieved with an outturn figure of 4.85 FTE days lost. Section 2.3 of the report takes you through the trends of absence across the year um, and advises that long-term absences account for most of the absence. And this is a main due to delays in employees receiving treatment due to COVID-19 and the impact on employees' mental health and wellbeing as a result of the pandemic. 2.4 of the report advises that the top five reasons for absence have remained consistent throughout the year with mental health remaining the top reason for absence. As advised at 2.5, in recognition that mental health remains a top reason for absence, a wealth of resources available to both managers and employees on WorkWell NL, Learn NL and My NL. And also members will be aware of the work that's being undertaken in regards to the Council's mental health and wellbeing strategy that provides a solid framework for the Council, managers and employees to address mental health issues effectively and efficiently. Moving on to 2.5, you'll note the average day loss for COVID-19 related absences was 2.06 if the average day's loss. This is a comparison to local other authorities and it's low and we hope that this is due to the early health and safety interventions and joint working with the trade unions to ensure the well-being and safety of our employees at all times throughout this pandemic. And finally, section 2.6 of the report outlines the management action that is ongoing to assist employees to sustain attendance at work, with the focus again very much on addressing long-term absences and those associated with mental health to ensure that all employees are being appropriately supported and provided with an opportunity to return to the workplace at the earliest possible point. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Tracy. And the comments or questions for Tracy? Thank you. 
No. I'm going to do the recommendations on page 31. Agenda item number four, investors and people update. Tracy or Sarah, who's taking this one? It's myself, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's Sarah. Sarah, so, I do apologise. <laughs> that's all right, thank you. So I'm hoping that this is a, a very straightforward report. Um, it's really just an update for you in terms of where we are as an organisation against our as assessment of investors and people. Section one of the report really covers the background to investors and people, which was introduced to the Council in 2018 um, in our then Enterprise and Housing Resources um, Service. Since then, we have rolled the framework and accredited within education and families and reassessed within um, Chief Executive Services and Enterprise and Communities. And this is the first year, 2021, where we are going for full Council accreditation against the investors and people framework. Appendix 1 of the report shows you the framework dimensions and what we're essentially assessed against. What I would like to say and point out um, is, is that by default, the Investors and People Framework um, is our measure of aligning against the Scottish Government's Fair Work Framework, which was introduced in 2016. So that's therefore our benchmark of our leadership and management practices against the, the Scottish Government Fair, Fair Work Framework. Section 1.2 does talk about the full council accreditation, which we're undergoing just now. And section 2 really just covers the components um, of the assessment and what it involves. So there's an online and a paper survey. There's some a series of manager discussions. And there's also discussions that are carried out with our own internal review team um, with a sample um, of employees from across services. We hope that by the 18th of June, we'll have a consolidated set of results and a more fuller high level presentation of overall results by the 30th of June. Section 2.4 in the report um, indicates that from the assessment, we do get a clear set of recommendations. Those recommendations are then taken forward into an improvement plan, which you'll see in Appendix 2, um, and they're embedded in our Workforce the Future Plan and Strategy. And I'm not going to go over the improvement plan, but you can see a number of examples in Appendix 2 there where we've taken um, steps to improve our leadership development, to look at how we improve our communication channels and give our, our colleagues and employees a voice in the organisation, opportunities for to we um, dialogue around change in the organisation. We've made a significant investment in learning and development as well over the recent years, and we continue to make sure that our policies, as Tracy has mentioned, um, are relevant, are meaningful, and are embedded across the organisation. So I'm not going to get into any more detail than that. I think, as I say, it's fairly straightforward, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions to this report? Councillor Duffy, John Watson here at Unison. Can I come back? I was trying to get in in the previous and Tracy's uh, issues, um, um, but I, I couldn't get the unmute button off. Can I just go back, if it's OK, and if you permit me, to, um, just to speak about the mental health issues and the absenteeism in the local authority? And my apologies for not getting on the system quicker. Um, no, fair enough, John. We've, we've all suffered that, I think, and it's yep. a quite an important point. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Unison produced a document, uh, a survey, um, one year of COVID, and we've passed it on to HR, and um, I hope you can have access to that, and I can certainly send you it. But um, it's quite a significant uh, survey that we have done uh, over the last couple of months, and 12,000 of our members uh, replied to it. And it highlighted a major issue with regards to stress and mental health uh, within the workplace. And in fact, 44% of our members um, felt that they've had increased, uh, their mental health st uh, st stress has increased rapidly. And in fact, 27% of them indicated that they've had to seek additional medical assistance from their GP. Um, whilst we uh, understand that this is a ticking time box uh, and a bomb actually, and we know that the council are looking and have addressed many issues in that. We just want to highlight that the report gives us significant concerns and we are willing to continue to work with the local authority to try and reduce this. I think it's somewhere in the region of 33% attendance uh, absences with this, uh, which is a major concern for us during the pandemic. So uh, I think it's really important that everyone on the, the call gets access to this survey report and I'm willing to pass that on to Mark or whoever to, to um, 
distribute that out to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, John. And if yep, yeah, certainly take that up and get that over to Martin. All the members of the JCC can get a, a, a look at that. And I know it's certainly something the mental health strategies that's came to JCC quite a lot, and rightly so. And it's something we can pick up at perhaps even the next meeting, if that's okay. That's fine. I'll do that. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Uh, Back to item four, and there was no comments or questions, so if we can agree to the recommendations on page 37. Agenda item number five is the employee relations update, and Tracy Simpson is going to take us through this report. Thank you. Um, so this report provides members with an update on the work that's currently underway um, or planned for the employee relations team in the coming months. Um, but it also involves partnership working with our trade union colleagues and other teams in people and organisational development. Um, section one of the report explains that as we progress through the recovery phases of COVID-19, it is important that we ensure our policies and procedures remain fit for purpose, whilst considering the changing needs of our workforce and the council as it begins the implementation of its ambitious plans for the future. Coupled with this, we have to consider ongoing legislative changes that may impact on policy. You will note from 2.1 that following ongoing discussions with the trade unions regarding the home working scheme interim, a further survey will be shortly issued to those participating in the scheme to seek their views and opinions. And at the request um, and, and in discussions with the trade unions, the survey will focus more heavily on mental health and wellbeing. Um, and a separate one is also being developed for managers to allow us to gauge the level of interactions that are taking place with employees. The results of these surveys will be discussed with the trade unions with appropriate solutions being sought to any issues identified. 2.2 confirms that considering recent events, we will be reviewing our smarter working policy to ensure, again, it remains fit for purpose and allows for the flexibility that is now desired by both employees and the organisation. 2.3 explains that a review of the Dignity at Work policy is well underway, and the next stage will be the consultation process with our trade union colleagues. 2.4 advises that due to the increased number of employees working from home, our alcohol and drugs policy needs reviewed, with further consideration being given to the parameters around testing. And as part of the Council's commitment to supporting breastfeeding mothers, 2.5 confirms that whilst the Council already supports this, a more formal policy is being produced. And finally, 2.6 confirms the recent changes that have been made to the Flexible Retirement Scheme for members of the Strathclyde Pension Fund, allowing those who have been in the scheme for at least two years and are age 55 or over the opportunity to apply for flexible retirement. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Tracy. Any comments or questions on this report? Quiet day. Excellent. So we can agree to the recommendations on page 45 and have a lovely day and thanks for your attendance. Well, thanks for the Thank chair. You. Thank you. Thank you.